Hey, how are you? Dr. Komotar, such a pleasure saying hi to you. It is absolutely great. Great to see you. How's everything? Everything is good. Cooking up a storm, as you can see, always of with course. my jacket as you wear your uh, doctor. <laughs> of course. I mean, the cooking never stops. And, and, and thank you for all you do. And uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction just while everyone logs on, of course, for those people who may not know, uh, Chef Lorena. Uh, she is a world-renowned celebrity chef. She has arguably the best restaurant in Miami called Chica. If you have not been there, you absolutely have to go. Uh, phenomenal restaurant. Uh, but she's here to talk about something which is uh, very near and dear to our hearts and her heart. And uh, it's one of the more difficult uh, conditions that we take care of in neurosurgery, uh, and that's glioblastoma. Uh, she's the ambassador for the uh, glioblastoma research organization, uh, which has become the largest uh, GBM research organization uh, on social media. Very, very successful, have already funded four major projects. And as background for people who may not know about uh, a glioblastoma. Uh, it's one of the more common adult brain tumors, um, highly aggressive, very difficult to treat. Uh, surgery is almost always the first option, followed by adjuvant therapy, meaning radiation and chemotherapy. Uh, survival, every now and then there is a long-term survivor, but in general, uh, the prognosis for this condition, even with the best surgery and the best treatment, uh, still remains very grave. And so, Clearly, this is something that we need to make a difference in, and we're going to get into that today as to how the glioblastoma uh, research organization started and kind of what their mission is. Um, the, this organization was started back in 2018 uh, by Amber uh, Barak, whose father unfortunately passed away from this condition. Um, it's a 501c3 nonprofit organization uh, with a focus of everything glioblastoma. Uh, they really have a very unique worldwide approach, and we'll talk about that, uh, where they partner up with uh, world-renowned clinics across the U.S. and Europe, uh, looking to support research objectives uh, and really innovative therapies for GBM, which are so heavily needed. Um, having this global network not only allows them uh, to connect with experts all around the world, but also has a support group, and we'll talk about that as well, because not only is the science so important, but the emotional support group for this condition uh, is, is just equally as important. Um, and as I said, in a very short period of time, this organization uh, has really become the preeminent GBM organization on social media. So we're very proud to have them on uh, you know, with us today. Thank you, Lorena. Thanks to Amber and your entire team. And really a pleasure to have you on today. Thank you, doctor. I, I cannot be happier. Uh, you know, I'm tied into this through my brother, and uh, there is so many things that happen. I think you have to go through the grief in order to go to the other side, and then really be prepared and ready to talk about it. Because sometimes you're not ready to talk about it, and you know everything that happens in the family and everything goes upside down. It takes time really to process everything, and then say, okay, what can I do so others won't go through what I went through as a family member, as my brother that is a patient. You know, there's a lot going on. Correct. And that's that's the importance, I think, of this interview, because people see the science behind it. We operate on these tumors all the time. Uh, but there's such an emotional connection behind this condition. And that's really what I what I want to get into. Uh, tell us a little bit about how the GBM Research Organization was first founded. Yes. Yeah, so Amber Barbach, uh, she's a fantastic lady. I had the honor to meet her and her father passed away, like you said, in October 2018. And she wanted to do something to honor her father. Uh, and then she realized that going through research and going through trying to find out a little bit more about uh, glioblastoma multiform, there wasn't that much of information in terms of research or what was being done. And, and that sparked her uh, motivation to do something to honor her father. And that's how uh, the, the organization uh, was formed. And what was, what was the initial mission of the organization and how has that changed over time? Absolutely. Well, first of all, it's about raising awareness. I think that that's one of the things that are most important because with awareness, then people know about it and can talk about it. Then you realize that there is more common than not. And then hopefully to find, to find the fundings like you will find for breast cancer, right? So it's trying because it's very hard to go under that, that umbrella of, uh, of funding. So trying to find global cutting edge research and to find uh, really the support for members of the family as well that there is not much out there. So I think that that was pretty much the mission, how it started. And now, of course, continue to create awareness more, more than anything at this point. 
Now tell us a little bit about your personal ties to glioblastoma. Absolutely, doctor. So my brother was diagnosed on June 2018. Uh, it was crazy. He was on a plane traveling to Miami for three days. And he calls me and said, sister, you know, I haven't told my mother or my wife what's going on. Uh, but you know, something happened to me. I was eating and I dropped uh, the fork on the plane. And then I had a lunch yesterday. And again, I was talking and while I was eating on the lunch, my fork dropped again. And I'm like, oh. I don't like this. Let's go to my, you know, doctor, uh, family doctor, and, and let's talk to her. So we went, talked to her. She was very, uh, I would say, just listening to him, all, all this, you know, the scenes that he had. And then when he started talking about the things that happened to him on the plate, she stood up. She said, okay, hold on. We need to move fast. And she ordered some uh, scat cans. I remember middle of the night on a Friday night trying to go, in, you know, in Miami to find a place. We did. And, and on Monday, uh, it we got the results and, and yeah, it was a glioblastoma multiform. So incredible, we never heard about it. We didn't know what to do. Uh, we went to a very recognized hospital here in which they said there is nothing that we can do. Um, unfortunately, this is what it is. Uh, they had, they did a surgery, they kind of clean it up. Uh, they were not able to remove the, the tumor and, and that was it for us. So. That was my search, doctor, to find who can help us. This cannot be it. I cannot be saying to my brother, say goodbye. He's 50 years old. And, you know, through the acts of God, uh, I have a friend that is a chef in Chicago that had, um, you know, ties to Oprah Winfrey. And through Oprah, we find a doctor that said, you need to find Dr. Komodar. And doctor, I went through the research to, to get you. And, uh, and actually, I was able to find an appointment with you in, in two, three days. And the day that you saw my brother, you practiced surgery the next day in the morning. He wasn't even able to leave the hospital. And, and you know, the, the history, you, you are uh, one of those angels in so many lives, but you touched mine. I was the one waiting uh, in, the, in the operating room outside in the, in, the, in the waiting room. And they told us, well, this is gonna last about six hours. So about three and a half hours after we got called, I got called and I'm, Oh my God, something bad happened. What happened here? This, is, this took less than usually, you know, people are saying here in the hospital and you say, no, everything is fine. We were able to remove the tumor and we're going to continue with this process. So that was like the first time, doctor, that we realized, okay, there is hope. There is hope that we don't have to say goodbye to my brother. He entered into the clinical trial that you guys have and, and he's alive. He's alive today after two and a half years. He continues to live with it, and, and he continues to go through the clinical trials, but it's one of those things that change our family. Uh, I don't think that nothing has impacted us more than this. We uh, are from Venezuela, and as you can see with the political situation, everybody lives everywhere. And in that moment, everybody flew from Europe, the people that were in Latin America, and we all met, and were together as a unit and trying to really find out what can we do. And that's how, you know, this whole history started and, and it was very impactful and like I, like I said doctor uh, there is so little really in terms of research and to know we probably know what it is but we don't know what causes it we, we don't know so many questions and, and that's one of the things that I think emotionally as, as a family we did not know what to do and, and being in your team and, and being able lucky enough to be in Miami because he wasn't able to travel and it's all those things that I think got led us to to be in your hands and then from there we took our path so so that's pretty much how it happened so you can only imagine as an angel that you are uh you're a huge angel in my family uh, as a whole <laughs> well i i'm i'm only one part of the team and i can tell you that i'm very lucky as you experienced everyone from the nurses to the staff to the anesthesiologist to the medical neuro-oncologist i mean there's such a large component to the care of your brother and i can only say that our team is phenomenal but Looking, looking back at your experience, what would you tell other families that are going through something similar? What would you do differently? What would be your advice to families going through similar, similar tragedies? Absolutely, doctor. And I think that's why I'm doing this uh, because I found myself uh, alone. I'm the one in my family that lives here. 
nobody else does. And, and it is just uh, try to find, number one, a second opinion. I think that is so important. People that, that have gone through this before, I think that is extremely important as well. If I can say something, is try to find Dr. Komotar <laughs> at the University of Miami. <laughs> save my life. It's something that I continue to say, doctor. It's, it's, it's really finding a team and really finding someone that can guide you through what are the steps. I didn't know that the step was surgery, then a radi radiation or chemotherapy and then if there is a chance for a clinical trial do it so those steps you know we could have easily before go straight to radiation and that would have been it because he didn't have the surgery before so even going through other hospitals that probably they don't give you these options make sure that you exhaust every single piece of finding a second or a third opinion and trying to find people that are actually related and treat this sickness uh, in a better way than just going to a hospital and just realizing this is what we're going to do. And that's it. I think that the key for us was let's go out. This cannot be the answer. This is, the, we can, you cannot do anything else. That cannot be it. There is always something else that we can do. I mean, I, I think that we see that here a lot at the university. We see people who come from other hospitals mm -hmm. who have been treated by people who are not specialists. And I, I think what you're saying is very important in the sense that brain tumors are relatively rare and you need to seek specialists just like for any medical condition you want someone who does a lot of it and fortunately here we do a lot of it so talk about the glioblastoma research organization and how you educate the public because like you're saying second opinions understanding clinical trials specialists what the next steps are how do you guys educate the public which is so key Absolutely. So, you know, first, of course, we focus a lot into the research, right? So uh, the, the, the board members identify what are the biggest clinics that, uh, that have patients with glioblastoma, the doctors that the most have these type of cases, and then the members go to the clinics and do the research, talk to the doctors, say, you know, what are the studies that you guys are doing? How can we help? And then, of course, raising awareness and funds through social media. You know, before pandemic, we used to have two to three events a year that people could come in and really uh, do their, uh, their fundings. But now, with uh, post-pandemic, what, what I'm doing actually specifically is uh, creating a, a cooking class and doing virtually and creating funds and then really trying to uh, give us most information through our social media channels, through ambassadors like myself, that we can talk about it and try to continue to, the, to, to create awareness, which I think uh, at this point is, is so key. Uh, so people know what, a, sometimes people don't know what a glioblastoma is. It's a, yeah. really, what is that? And they don't even know what that means. And, and, and I think that is super important to, to bring that. Yeah, I think people, people look at cancer and they think that all cancers are the same. And I think it's important for people to realize that relative to other forms of cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, Brain cancer is relatively underfunded by the government. Yes. Um, why do you think that is? I think because exactly that, doctor, there is not awareness. And I think that we want to not take this nationally, but globally, really, is that because there is not such a, much of awareness of what it is, then we, we're almost like stigmatized, right? That uh, you really don't know what it is. You really don't know. There is more than 200,000. 200,000, yes, I was seeing the number. Uh, patients with glioblastoma. So when you start seeing that this is more common than not, my brother is 52 years old. So he's a, he's a young guy that, you know, very active. So you never know where it's coming from. So when you were talking about, for example, breast cancer, you can have that umbrella, right? Because it's more known, people know about it, the government helps. So what we need to do is try to find that for glioblastoma and understand that not all cancers are different, uh, are different but at the same time, we need, we need uh, the support of the government. We need these fundings because without that, doctor, uh, it's going to be really... Mm, more difficult to find research, right? Continue to do the studies that we need. So I think it's about, that's why it's so important for the organization to create awareness. And that's what I was automatically drawn, of course, after all that happened to my brother. And I started, of course, following you, doctor, and following the organization is, I'm, I'm here for you guys, whatever that I can do in my art to bring awareness to this sickness and to this cancer, I'm all for it and, and, and completely open to do whatever we need to do to people to know just the simple fact of what it is a glioblastoma. Yeah, I mean, how people to need, it and all that. Because I think people need to realize that, that the fundraising truly does make a difference. And I think that's important. If you look at breast cancer and you look at lung cancer and how much we've advanced in the last decade or two, it's phenomenal. 
people with breast cancer have a much better prognosis now than they did 20 years ago. People with lung cancer have a much better prognosis. And that's because of the vigorous research that goes on. And so I applaud you and the organization for what you're trying to do to push in that direction. Now, how do you guys identify top notch projects? Because you guys must get applications from all over the world of the best scientists looking at all promising research projects. How do you select the best? Identifying those top cancer centers. I think that is key because that's when you're gonna find out who has the most glioblastomas uh, uh, cases. And you were talking about the prognosis, which is very poor for glioblastomas. You, you know, it's, it's almost confusing. So doing that, then the board members of the organization uh, identify, okay, so these are the hospitals and the clinics that have the most cases. Then the members of the organizations go to these clinics and meet with different team members to say, okay, what are the research that you're doing? So it's a really close identification of where these resources are going based on the amount of patients, based on the amount of doctors, and based on the amount of research that they do. And that's how all the resources that we're creating and as an organization goes to. But this is a, a panel not only of the board members, but also the members of the organization. And then finally, of course, going to the clinics and identifying what are going to be those studies that we can support. Yeah, I mean, you guys are going to be supporting one of our cutting edge projects. And so you know, we're obviously very grateful uh, for all of your fundraising, pushing our projects forward. Uh, and there's so many deserving projects around the country. H how do you guys exactly fundraise? Maybe just go over how people who are listening can help. How can people get involved with the organization? Absolutely, doctor. So, you know, there are different ways. We mostly do it through, uh, through uh, I can tell you exactly the page, www. GBM, which means glioblastoma multiform, gbmsearch.org. And of course, you have through a, a different uh, uh, fundraiser uh, portals like GoFundMe Charity. Uh, you also have Just Giving, GuideStar, uh, as well as our socials. But we really focus, focus on our social. But more than anything, what we really want is that people to read what is a glioblastoma. If you want to do, uh, uh, you want to uh, give a, a I forgot the word <laughs> in Spanish. When you want to actually uh, provide and, 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 and make a deposit, it is make your educated decision, right? Of, of, if, if you want to help, read about it. Then you really understand what is going on, and then you can have an educated decision of how to uh, uh, participate and in, in donate. That was the word that... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you get me a little bit nervous, Dr. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> so to donate, and, and, and again, you know, we'll, we'll have in my social media channels, I put in my bio where people can read, make an educated decision, and then donate. I think that with that, we can continue to create awareness. And of course, through cooking classes that I'm going to give, giving, uh, giving out, doctor, and I hope that you can join one. Oh, Lord have mercy. Okay. Dishes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That could be dangerous. Um, yeah. What I was going to say, um, you know, what I love about your guys' uh, support group is that not only are you guys fundraising, which is obviously one of the most important arms of your organization, but the educational piece I find to be just as important because, like you said, people don't know what a glioblastoma is. They don't realize that this is that this happens more often than they think. And until recently, until people like Ted Kennedy developed brain tumors. No one even knew what this was. And so I think putting it on the map like you guys are doing is so critical. And then on that same page, talk a little bit about the, the your guys support network. Cause I feel like the emotional component of this disease is just as devastating as the physical. And you guys have a great support group, which is worldwide. So people can discuss their experiences, understand that they're not alone and feel like they're supported. People feel scared and alone, doctor. That's the feeling that I got when my brother got diagnosed. My family also, we were scared and alone and we didn't really know what it was. And I think that support system is an, as, as important as the research and the awareness and the donations. So uh, it's exactly that, it's creating a space so uh, the families and the patients feel comfortable sharing. And I think also, for example, for somebody like me telling my story, so maybe if I did something that can guide you through your 
experience, I think that is important. And that's why I think that it's almost a process in which you're going through these emotions, you're going through this moment that is chaotic and puts your family upside down. But then at the same time, once you process all of that, how can I help? How can I come to the other side? And really, if I can give you my life story or what I did, maybe that can help you in your journey of, of not only the, the medical part of it, but the spiritual part, the emotional part that it gives so much because the stress alone, I mean, it's, it's something that you can represent physically. And, and, and that's, that's a, a, such an important moment, I think, when you're, even for the, for the caretakers, that they go through that drainage of emotions. My mother, my God, that was her birthday when she had, my brother had surgery. And, and just the whole emotional part was as intense as the sickness itself. So I think having that space is so important. And I'm so happy and so glad that the organization is also putting attention into creating this uh, safe environment that you can talk, that you can feel that you're not alone. Correct. And I, and I think that also speaks to your guys' worldwide approach, the international approach that your um, organization has taken, which most organizations stick to a, one particular state or country. You guys have gone global, which I think is completely innovative. Talk a little bit about why you guys went global and the impact of that on your overall organization. Of course, why we, we shouldn't keep it in the in the in the confinement of our borders. Why not all the world should know what a glioblastoma it is, right? And and also try to stretch it not only as the sickness itself, but also as a support group that the entire world knows about it. So we can create more awareness and really see that this is something more common than not. And that is happening that, 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 so we can step away from not knowing what a glioblastoma is. And I think as we push our boundaries so that no one needs to feel alone in this process. And I think that is something that goes beyond our language, like food, doctor, it goes beyond language, right? It's, that it's is just true. That, that feeling and that something that nurtures you and, and I think that is something that everyone should, should be aware of. Now, a lot of, a lot of people have tried to start fundraisers, organizations, you know, for different diseases. You guys have been uniquely successful. As I talked about, in a very short period of time, you guys have become the biggest glioblastoma research organization on social media. You've already funded four major research projects, which is tremendous. What do you think accounts for your success as an organization? I think number one, that we went through it. I think that the fact that when you go through something like this, you, you have the experience of, okay, what, how can I help? So what happened to me doesn't happen to every, you know, everyone else that goes through this experience. And I think that that's, that's been a key. Also, uh, the commitment, the commitment to really being able to uh, spread the knowledge, uh, to bring awareness that, uh, you know, the, the, the prognosis has been so poor, but now really giving a little bit more light to, to we, we know what it is, but how this reproduce, how, there's so many questions, doctors. I always think, you know, and this is one of, I was reviewing the question. It's like, like a diver going into the ocean, right? And then you can, you know where you're going, but there's so many questions beneath, right? How this is mutating? Why is this happening? What is causing it? So there's so many questions that still need to be answered. And I think the success of the organization is really focusing to that and, and creating that space of let's bring research because without research, doctor, I mean, we won't find the answers. And I think that's why the, the, the elaboration of all these initiatives that we can do in person and of course, you know, we will have to pivot and we will do it uh, through uh, social media channels, through Zoom, whatever we need to do digitally and in person to continue to create these funds to focus on research because that will give us the answers. I mean, I would say that a big component of your guys' success is your leadership between Amber and you. And like, like you said, having a personal touch, having gone through it, you can't replicate that, that kind of emotional tie. And I think your leadership has been tremendous. Where do you see this organization going in the future? Wow, doctor. I mean, as an ambassador, I'm their first ambassador and I couldn't be happier. I'm like ready, eager. I'm, I'm totally, you know, ready to, to process this uh, as internationally as we can, as, as big as we can possibly uh, do so we can find the most amount of money and funds to give you 
as, uh, or help with a little grain of sand to the research that you do, doctor, como tal, as many other doctors and clinics and hospitals do uh, uh, across the, the... And that will continue to be our mission is, is uh, you know, focus and, and, and really executing the initiatives that we have as these great leaders of the organization have to continue to spread uh, the research, to continue to find those answers and hopefully the cure. Doctor, that's, that's, I don't want to, I don't want to, there is not a cure for this, but, you know, there is a path for it. I mean, that would be the goal, and I think that's what everyone is expecting. And um, talk a little bit about just a sneak preview of Project Garcia coming in the fall. Um, I just, I know that's obviously very near and dear to your heart, something that we're all looking forward to. Maybe just give us a sneak preview about Project Garcia and what that's all about. Of course, Dr. So, as, as you can, you know, I'm a chef, I cook, I have restaurants all over the place, and, and that's what I want to do. I want to create awareness, I want to feed people through it. I've been able to be successful by feeding people and doing it with love and commitment. And it's the same commitment and the same leadership and the same uh, entrega, the same giving that the organization has. And, and as we continue to do this, uh, you know, bring it to you, Dr. You, again, uh, you know, your group, your team, and, and, and your research and everything that you do is so important to me that it's exactly that. It's going to be for you guys to, uh, to continue your research and, and hopefully find that exact uh, point of, uh, of uh, need that you might have uh, in order to, to continue your amazing work and continue to save life as you've been doing, Doctor. Well, I think it's, it's, it's very refreshing to talk to you, and I think that you're one of those family members who realizes that it's a very difficult you know, a condition and you've made a commitment to make a difference. And I think, you know, if, I, I feel like if more patients and more families took the initiative that you're taking, I feel like we would make much more progress. And I think what you're saying is very inspirational. Do you have any advice for family members going through the exact same situation? Absolutely, doctor. I think that the approach has to be more than just the diagnosis. It has to be, of course, the medicine and following your doctor's opinion. Once you realize that there is hope, if, 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 I think that if you go to a place that there is no hope, find hope and, and, and not taking no for an answer to the end. Number two, take also an approach of, of a, a, a good lifestyle, meaning uh, what you eat, uh, your nutrition, your exercises, your, your, what you do with your body. I mean, it, it has to be a shift so you can have a better quality of life that can prepare you for the treatments that are coming up and, and, you know, and everything, the medicines that you're going to take. So I think that, that is something that goes related. And also spiritually and emotionally what happens. Find somebody to talk to, either a family member of these great, incredible uh, groups that the organization puts together so you can have not only as a patient, but as a family and as a support system to go through these, to exchange ideas and have the experience to be a little bit more positive. So you don't feel so alone. And I think by doing that, you're gonna be able to sustain and, and be able to go through this in the best, best possible way and support your family member that is going through this. So that would be my advice. That's what we did. And thank God, uh, you know, it worked out. Or it's I mean, working you, out so far. I mean, you are just an exceptional role model, I think for family members dealing with this. Um, congrats to everything you and Amber and the leadership at the glioblastoma research organization have done. You guys, I think, have created a model for what other people should follow in terms of having, you know, dealing with hardship and then making a commitment to make a difference. And I think that's huge. Um, so, you know, we are delighted to do any type of collaboration you want. Look forward towards Project Garcia. And for people who haven't been to your restaurant, Chica in Miami, arguably the best restaurant in Miami. Fantastic. You got to try it out. So. Again, thank you for all you do. Delighted with your efforts, and it's a real pleasure to talk to you today. Chef, today, Chef, doctor. <laughs> I, listen, I, I take if chef I any day. I will, you'll be a chef. I, I'll person. take a chef any day. That's fine. I'm far from it, but. <laughs> doctor, thank you so much. It was a, a, such a special moment for me talking to you today. Again, uh, uh, it's one of those things that, you know, I can talk in front of a thousand people doing a cooking demo, and it's like a, it's a second nature. Talking to you, I'm literally nervous. It, it was 
uh, such a delight and such a pleasure. And, and thank you, doctor. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, from all the patients that you have saved their lives for what you do, for your commitment to continue to uh, find the cure for this. I, I, we need... We need you, we need to clone you all over the world. I'm a big <laughs> fan of yours, doctor, whatever you need and everything and anything that I can do to bring awareness, to raise money for your uh, research, uh, I'm all for it. You have a, an ambassador, you have a wing girl with you that, you know, anything that needs to be done, we will do and we'll continue to grow this community to create more awareness and more money for research. Chef Lorena, you are the best. And listen, you know, please give my love to the entire family, okay? I will. I will, doctor. Thank you very right. much. Have a Take great care. afternoon. Take Thank care. You guys.